So a very warm welcome to this afternoon's program. Um, my name is David Goodman. I'm uh, one of the trustees of the, the Janky Foundation. And uh, a very warm welcome to those who are here for the first time at Global Cooperation House. Can I show, show of hands who are here for the first time? Yeah. That's great. So a very warm welcome. And a very warm welcome to our friends who are listening online as well. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you could keep your mobile phones off or on silence. Um, there's drinking water behind uh, as you came in, and also the washrooms are there if you need them. And in case the fire alarm it sounds, then you will be uh, required to evacuate the building immediately. And the ushers will guide you to the nearest emergency exits. And the ushers are the young ladies, I can call them young, in the sashes. <laughs> They're all young to me. <laughs> So, um, as you know, this is the, the program is being hosted by the, the Janki Foundation and in collaboration with uh, the Brahma Kumaris and uh, Global Cooperation House. Here is the uh, the international headquarters of the of the of the Brahma Kumaris, um, and just a little. Obviously, tonight's. Uh, program you can see courage and compassion in a time of crisis and uh, I think this is a very a very relevant topic uh, for what's going on in the world with COVID and all the other things so I think it's a very timely thing to discuss. Um, just a little bit about the connection of Janki Foundation and Brahma Kumaris. Um, the, the Brahma Kumaris is an international organization essentially teaching, I would say, uh, self-development uh, and uh, the, the key practice being Raj Yoga meditation. And I think now we've prob probably got centers in around 100 countries. Um, and the, there was some land uh, in Mount Abu where they the spiritual headquarters of the Brahma Kumaris are. Uh, that's in northwest India, in Rajasthan. And uh, when the thought came to uh, start a hospital, um, that land was was given uh, to start the initiative for the hospital. Uh, there is a, a very nice video that we're going to show shortly about the hospital. But it is an area, really, where there's very, very poor health services. And so it was a great it was uh, a great need. And the Janki Foundation was initially set up essentially to support, to support the hospital. And uh, our work outside of India uh, is really focused on supporting and promoting the well-being of uh, health professionals and patients. Uh, and the, uh, the, the common factor is uh, Daddy Janki, who uh, was, for those of you who knew her, was quite an amazing woman. Uh, she was based in London for many years and was for many years the, the, the head of the Brahma Kumari. She passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but um, very, very spiritual person. And it was really her inspiration, and I would say the driving force for the establishment of the uh, of the hospital, she really wanted to support this. I mean, she did nurse in her early days, and so that's a, a little bit of a connection. Both are, are uh, charities, and, and the, the Janki Foundation is a, a UK-based charity. Um, and I think, you know, when we, when we started the Janki Foundation, like coming up to nearly 25 years ago, there was a huge amount of pressure on health services and a huge amount of pressure on, on uh, basically health professions. And I think, 
<laughs> 25 years on, we're probably at the same situation, dialed up probably, I don't know, times 100. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on the health service. And I know for myself, when I was working as a dentist, when you're under pressure, it's very easy to lose that person-centered, that human human connection with the stresses. And so the Janke Foundation was really uh, promoting the practice of human-centered, person-centered health care. And it, it really acknowledges the, the really central role of thoughts, positive thoughts, positive feelings, in, and compassion, and things like kindness, which again disappear sometimes <laughs> when we're stressed. Uh, in maintaining well-being and preventing illness. So that's just a little, uh, a little connection, really, be between the two uh, charities. Um, OK, so I've done that. So really, um, I think we can, we're going to show a, a film of, of uh, Global Hospital. Dr. Dr. Patel Mida is the, who's going to be uh, speaking in conversation with Dr. Sarah Egger, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background uh, to that in a, in a minute. But um, the hospitals in, as you see, it's, it's in quite a remote area. There's very, very poor health services. And, and uh, I think, for me, one of the interesting things about it, it as well as having the, the normal allopathic, you know, the more normal healthcare services, there was also a great emphasis on spirituality. It has a department of spiritual well-being, and, um, and uh, many of the many of the staff have a spiritual practice, uh, practice spiritual awareness and, and, and meditation. And so those things have also been incorporated into the work of the hospital. And I think I've actually had the chance to work there when I, I'm long, long since retired now, but when I was practicing, uh, I had a chance to work there. And it was a very, very unique, it's a very unique hospital. Uh, it was very nice to have a little time out in a dedicated, uh, meditation room. <laughs> um, okay, so I think that's probably all I want to say. Um, so I think if we can uh, show the the video of the hospital, that'll give us a better idea of of, of Dr. Midder's work. Yep. Yeah. located in Mount Abu. Popularly called Global Hospital, this haven for healing was established in 1991 in a hill town in Rajasthan, West India, to fill a gap in the locally available health services. Back then, the district's population of 650,000 was served by barely four hospitals with 450 beds. To establish this very special hospital, the Brahma Kumaris, an organization teaching Raj Yoga meditation, teamed up with a philanthropist doctor and businessman. Global Hospital 
has never turned down a patient for want of his or her ability to pay for health care. Patients walk in for free consultations by a panel of specialists. A well-equipped laboratory and imaging department offer diagnostic services. Those needing further care are admitted to the intensive care unit, private rooms or general ward. The operating theatres are equipped for simple as well as complex procedures such as head and neck cancer surgery, knee joint replacements, orthopedic procedures to fix fractured limbs, abdominal cancers, cleft lip and palate reconstructions, eye surgery, C-sections and other gynac procedures. Global Hospital is unique for offering both modern and alternative medicine systems under one roof. Patients can opt for homeopathy, Ayurveda and magnet therapy instead of modern medicine or consult doctors from both systems of medicine. We started with the homeopathy, Ayurveda and magnet therapy and our emphasis was because meditation is our strength, Raj Yoga meditation, so we incorporated that into picture. Global Hospital also has a department dedicated to wellness where a qualified counsellor teaches Raj Yoga meditation. Global Hospital is located in Sirohi, one of India's most backward districts. One in three people in the district is illiterate and of tribal origin or from a less privileged caste. Employment opportunities in the district are very limited. Poverty and ignorance of modern medicine abound. To serve people living in Sirohi's villages, Global Hospital runs three mobile clinics. The village outreach initiatives have been an integral part of the hospital since day one. These doctor assistant driver teams cover hundreds of kilometers every week following preset routes to stop at remote villages. Over the years, villagers have shared some of their hesitation to modern medicine and anxiously wait to consult the doctors. From the day one, we not only had the main hospital but we started with the village outreach, healthcare programs in the, for the villages. In West India, cataract in the elderly is common and a major reason for dependency and restricted living. At a branch of Global Hospital at the foothills called the Global Hospital Institute of Ophthalmology, thousands of elderly people needing cataract surgery are operated on every year. A few hundreds more are operated on at a satellite unit in the neighboring district Jalore at the Sri Adinath Fateh Global Eye Hospital. Doctor and optometrist teams scar villages to identify those with mature cataracts. Outreach initiatives are essential because many villagers with cataract have no idea that their vision can be restored. Another branch of Global Hospital, the Radha Mohan Mehrotra Global Hospital Trauma Center, started out as a dedicated trauma unit with a surgeon and orthopedic specialist, but has since brought on board a neurosurgeon to cater to serious trauma cases involving head and other injuries. A dentist, an ENT specialist, physicians, a pain specialist, a physiotherapist, and diagnostic staff complete the team offering essential health services to District Sirohi. The unit also houses the Rotary International Global Hospital Blood Bank, the first private sector blood bank in Rajasthan to have been given the responsibility of a regional blood centre. Also at the foothills of Mount Abu, lie the Global Hospital School of Nursing and the Saroj Lalji Mehrotra Global Nursing College 
two institutions within one campus, offering nursing education at the diploma level as well as at the degree level. Students have done exceedingly well, gaining employment with India's premier medical institutions and even at an Indian research station in Antarctica. Shivmani Geriatric Home is a successful model of a place elderly people can call home when they need help in running a household. The 85 residents enjoy three meals in a day, in-house physiotherapy and a nurse on call and talks and events to keep them busy. The Brigadier Vora Clinic and Jyoti Bindu Diagnostic Centre is a branch of the trust in Vadodara. It houses a clinic and dialysis centre. BSES MG Hospital is a sister hospital in Mumbai run in partnership with the city's civic authority. With your support, a seed of an idea has blossomed into many units. With your continued support, we look forward to sustaining and growing the activities of the Global Hospital and Research Centre Trust. So I hope that I hope that gave you a, a nice idea of the work of the hospital. Um, now I'd like to invite up Karishma. Um, she's a student here at the uh, at Global House, a meditation student, and she's going to share a song uh, which she's written herself, and uh, it's called "Keep Going." And I think that's quite uh, a very appropriate title. Uh, I know Daddy Janky at times of difficulties just used to say, just keep going, don't stop. So, Krishna, it would be nice if you could just explain a little bit about how, how the song came to you before you sing it. Sure. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. I wrote this song at the end of March 2020. Uh, we had gone into lockdown by then. And um, not related to the pandemic, I was just going through something very difficult. Um, it was something that there was no answer to and nothing or no one was going to be able to help. And I remember one day um, I was struggling and I was just needing something to hold on to to help me through it. Um, and I asked myself, what am I supposed to do in this moment right now? And the words from inside just came, keep going. So I did, and it's become the mantra for me whenever I'm overwhelmed or uh, when there's no answer or I just can't process what's going on. Um, so this song is about some things that are personal to me, um, but also about things that I was aware people would be going through uh, because of the pandemic. So this is Keep Going. Thank you.
Wasn't that beautiful? And the words, I think, I, I think we could all do with maybe repeating those to ourselves. Thank you so much, Karishma. Um, now, one of the things that's happening as a consequence of COVID is, of course, all the the tension and the stress, and particularly on medical staff. And so there has been a couple of events um, arranged here uh, uh, by the Brahma Corps called uh, medita medi not medication, for medication, meditation for medics. Um, and I'd like to invite up uh, Swati Shukla, who's been part of that, maybe just to share your experience, Swati, of how, how that worked for you. Um, Swati's um, in charge of the pathology uh, departments in, I think, it's about 14 hospitals across London and the Midlands uh, collecting the blood. And uh, we had a chance to visit the Cromwell with, with Dr. Midder. Um, and I just saw an amazing amount of work of getting all the, the bloods in from all over and an incredibly efficient system, if I may say, and getting and turning the uh, results around very, very quickly. And for those of you who've been in the situation where you've been going to hospital for tests and things, which I have, um, it's such a lovely thing to get your results back quickly. <laughs> so there's less time to be worrying about them. Swati, will you come up and just share your experience? Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and Om Shanti to you. Um, I've been asked to step in because we did have a, another doctor who was due to speak, but due to circumstances, they weren't able to come. Um, I've been working in healthcare for over 35 years now, and as you're aware, most people choose to work in health sector because for the well-being of patients and care, not financial reasons. And I wanted to briefly share my experience of working in the hospital and the environment, particularly during the past two years. So during the past two years, everyone's been working 
extremely hard and the pandemic's taken its toll physically, mentally and emotionally on everyone. Uh, we all had to adapt to changes in work practices, not just in terms of wearing masks, distancing, but also when it came to wearing the full protective equipment, which was very, very uncomfortable, and to work for hours wearing that equipment was quite a challenge. Uh, we had wards that were divided into green, amber, and red, and that was constantly changing with people testing positive, having to move them to different areas. Um, there was an element of fear, even amongst the clinicians, because everyone was kind of scared of what would happen. Um, and there was a thing about, we've got advances in medicine and technology, and yet we had limited resources to tackle this disease and the virus. Um, we also lost a number of consultants and colleagues during this period, and that was particularly difficult for all the other staff to carry on. Patients were unable to have family members or friends at their bedside, and that was very, very difficult to manage. Uh, we had instances where we actually had family members sitting outside the hospital just to get regular updates for their loved ones. All the departments in the hospital, however, came together, and it was a true team effort to manage the situation. Uh, the nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, pharmacists, nutritionists, lab staff, we all became the patient's second family. At one point, we were performing thousands of COVID tests in a day, and the death toll was carrying on at over a thousand a day. Um, a colleague in ICU shared how holding the patient's hand just for 15 or 20 minutes with tears rolling down from their eyes, and there were no words. It was just a strong emotional experience, and that's how people got through these situations. A consultant shared that having worked for many, many years, helping so many patients get well and recover fully, they'd never come across a situation where they felt completely helpless. Patients were just literally not able to breathe. Um, care and compassion were definitely there, but this particular situation also required a lot of courage to face the challenges. Um, I think this topic today is very, very appropriate, and Karishma's song as well, just keep going. Uh, from a personal perspective, meditation and spirituality in my daily life has helped in so many ways. And I am sure that Dr. Pratap and Sarah's conversation will give us more tips and tools on how to manage challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Swati, for those uh, insights, literally from the cold place. Uh, it's quite moving, actually, to hear all that. And uh, <clears throat> I'm now going to sort of move on to our, our main section, where we're going to uh, invite shortly Dr. Sarah Egger and uh, Dr. Partha Midder to have a conversation. Sarah's going to uh, run some questions past Dr. Mid about his experience really of, of uh, the two phases of COVID in the hospital. Um, I've had the good fortune to be uh, with Dr. Midder for a couple of weeks as he's been traveling around the UK. So I've, I've uh, worked with good friends, both with uh, Dr. Egger and Dr. Midder for many years. But I also uh, was able to listen to like you were, you were serving, Swati, very real human experiences uh, at the coalface, uh, which I personally found quite moving and very, very inspiring. Um, 
So let me just give you a background. Dr. Sarah Egger is, a, is the present current chair of the Janky Foundation, and she's a retired consultant psychiatrist, so she was formerly based at Imperial College London, which was one of the hospitals we visited uh, while you were here. Um, she's had a, I know she's had a, a, a very deep interest in the connection of religion, spirituality, and psychiatry, and uh, she's on the committee of the World Psychiatric Association uh, on that topic. And also, some years back, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that there's a special interest group in the Royal College of Psychiatry, which is looking at spirituality, and Sarah, Dr. Eager was uh, the chair of that, and now she's on the committee. She's a long-term uh, Raj Yoga meditation practitioner herself, and she's also a mindful self-compassion teacher. So I think that's got a very experienced uh, person there. And also, uh, Dr. Midder, just a little bit of a background from the, uh, originally from Chandigarh in the Punjab. Um, he, when he first qualified, I think he was uh, working in paediatrics, so I was a paediatric dentist, children dentist, so Dr. Midder was working with children. And then he uh, found himself moving into management and administration, I think about for about eight, eight years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was listening to his story. When they asked him to do that, he said, I don't, don't actually have any experience of, admi of administration. And they said, it's OK, we'll, we'll help you. So I thought that was quite uh, courageous. Um, and it was really... Uh, on the basis of those that, that experience, that when the, the, the idea of the hospital came up in Mount Abu, then uh, Dr. Partab uh, was invited to come along and, 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 and do the work there. Because he himself uh, has been meditating since he was quite young, I think, as a child, because his parents were also meditation uh, practitioners. So, if I can invite Dr. Sarah Egger and Dr. Prathad Midder onto the stage. Just see. Make sure I haven't forgotten anything. No, I think I've, that's pretty much covered. So I'm really, I'm really interested to see uh, what comes out from this uh, conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all here, especially as we have a bit of competition from just down the road. <laughs> we know that the uh, English women's football team is in action or about to come into action very soon. So, um, Pratap, <laughs> I was just thinking the last time we saw each other before this visit, was just before COVID. <laughs> and I remember I, I got home from my visit to India and um, our nephew was visiting from, from Canada and his and my birthdays are very close, just at the beginning of March. And we went out, and I think that was the last time we went out for anything <laughs> before um, it all happened. And I was, I was looking at... <coughs> Um, the situation in India. It, it, I think you had your first case of COVID in January, in India in general, January 2020. You went into lockdown March 25th, which was quite close to us, really, because we went down uh, into lockdown mid-March. And on April the 1st of that year, you'd had 100 deaths, and by the end of April, you'd had 1,000. And then it escalated... It peaked in September 2020, again in May 21, and then, like us, you had another peak in January this year, but of the less 
virulent strain. So overall, you had in India 44 million cases and five. Uh, 526,000 deaths. And just, you know, for comparison, um, the UK, we had 23 million cases and 184,000 deaths. So this is, uh, you know, an unprecedented in our time um, situation. Uh, just to put it in context, so I, I'm just really wondering... Can you give us an idea? I mean, Swati really gave us a sense of what clinicians here were facing, but what was it like for you when it first started? And had you ever faced anything like this before? No, not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon and Om Shanti. Mm -hmm. Well, this was unprecedented, not for us, but all over the world. No one actually imagined the extent or the magnitude of this pandemic. We were taking it easy. I would say in the first wave, which happened much more severely in big cities, Mount Abu was little escape. We didn't have much cases. But we had trained our staff very well. We had rehearsed. We knew that it can come any time to Mount Abu also. At one time, the hotel lobby, because Mount Abu is a tourist destination, they didn't even pressurize that you shouldn't admit any patients with COVID, even if you had received. But we just listened to them, but we prepared our separate inpatient area for the COVID patient, trained our staff bought the supplies wherever it was available. Those days the major issue was the supply availability, the PP kits and masks, wherever it was available I collected it. Uh, we sent uh, messengers to Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Udaipur, wherever it was available we got it in whatever quantity we stored it. And the first way we did escape and the lucky um, advantage was in the beginning of 21, we had vaccination for almost all the staff. In the f first wave, most of our staff had COVID because a couple of cases would sp spring up without any warning. And many of our nurses, doctors, they um, suffered from COVID, but we were able to manage them. M I myself also had the... <laughs> Um, being exposed to COVID, but that was okay, I could manage it. The uh, supply availability was a major cause. And then in the bigger cities, what happened, no one was prepared, and uh, neither the doctors nor the infrastructure was so much that they could handle this pandemic of this magnitude. And most of the patients in the first wave, the Delta strain, it was a respiratory infection. The lungs were getting affected. And what they needed was supportive therapy in form of oxygen or ventilators or nebulizer or high flow nasal oxygen that were in short supply. But in the second wave, we were ready and we could manage the issues very well. We had, uh, we had converted our eye hospital into COVID hospital on the foothills of the mountains. And then the main hospital in Mount Abu was totally converted into COVID hospital. Even then we couldn't accept all the cases. There were so many number of patients coming. And you know, patients would come all across from Gujarat, from Rajasthan, because wherever they, they could find space, they would rush. Mm. And I would say, you know, it was, um, yes, it was unprecedented kind of a thing, but we were able to face the issues. And I would say the staff, the team, because of our, uh, I would say, spirituality being our strength. In the first wave, when there was totally lockdown, many of the doctors volunteered to have cut in their pay packets. Mm -hmm. And most of us uh, were working on 50% of our emoluments. And the nurses also volunteered to have one-fourth cut in their salary. Do you mind me asking how many deaths did you actually have? You in know? our hospital, mm -hmm. in the two months which we faced uh, uh, the, I would say, the maximum number of cases, we should have about maybe 65 deaths. Right. And we had treated almost 600 cases. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, thinking back at that time, uh, would you say, do you, you know, you had highs and lows? What was perhaps the worst day, the most challenging event for you? The worst day, I would say, were the patients who were waiting in ambulance and we didn't have ventilators for them. Right. We didn't have the bed available to them. And mm-hmm. So we had to make makeshift wards and we had to buy more ventilators. But the supplies took time, mm-hmm. you know. But then whatever, wherever it was available, we just went on, paid the price. And the, I would say, where there is a bill, there is a way. We could find things, we could borrow, we could uh, use ambulance, mm-hmm. transport ventilators, and we manage patients. Yeah, because you're making it sound a little bit like we were all prepared and everything was fine, but I know from no, speaking... I'm not saying, I'm yeah. not saying, but there were, as you asked, yeah. there were many cases which we had to turn down. We couldn't Gosh. accept because yeah. we had limited capacity. Yeah, because I, I've spoken to people who were there at the time and they were saying there were some very challenging days um, that you had to face, and, and I'd like to talk to you about that in a minute, but... Also, I'm wondering, because I think everyone faced huge challenges at that time, but were there some magical days? Were there days where things happened that you kind of thought, whoa, <laughs> that's... Well, in worst situation, the best also comes out. Yeah. You know, we, I was, you know, maybe it was intuitive or maybe it was uh, my experience. We ordered for oxygen plants, you know, the PSA plants which produce, which was standby for us. I ordered and the moment someone in the community came to know, he came out with a check. We didn't ask for it. Gosh. So this did happen, you know, people came forward. One particular philanthropist, he was an industrialist, he had his business in Abu only, and he came out and he said, whatever patients you treat, I would underwrite the cost. So in our Abu Road hospital, whatever patients were treated, he was taking care of the cost. So the best also came out, you know, in a small place, when you know everyone, everyone knows you, it makes all the difference. Mm. And there was something about how you, because I'd heard that the oxygen was very low, but how you overcame that problem, you ended up making your own oxygen. Well, that was tough time. You know, initially when we didn't have any, we didn't even have oxygen cylinders. We just had 20 cylinders. We had to borrow cylinders, whether we bought, got industrial cylinders, and we were not able to get oxygen in Rajasthan. We had to send our transport to Gujarat, Bhavnagar, Vadodara. There we got the supply. Mm-hmm. But there also good people came to our rescue. They said, okay, you send and we'll supply. Mm-hmm. And did you, have you noticed through going through this whole uh, experience with the hospital and the community, has anything changed in the way you, the hospital runs? or any changes within your relationship with the community? What do you think the effects of Well, I would say it it was the team which mattered the most. Mm -hmm. Everyone cooperated, everyone understood that this is the time when we have to put in our best. Whether it was nurses or whether it was housekeeping staff or the kitchen staff, everyone came together. You know, otherwise the scare was so much, people would not go closer to a patient. You know, we did one experiment during these times. We asked our spiritual counselor to put a PP kit and go around the patients and talk to them. And she was going almost every day. And as a result, she also suffered COVID. And, but after recovering from COVID, she again started going. Mm-hmm. So it did make the difference in the second wave. We even allowed the patient's relatives to go once in a day, maybe for 10 minutes to go and talk to the patient. Because that made all the difference. Yeah, I think that's been one of the hardest things here in the UK is the fact that relatives could not mm, yes. be with their uh, we, we, we took our challenges and we took our systems, although it wouldn't, if it was a public hospital, it may not have been allowed. No. <laughs> so you had um, some flexibility there. And, and, and also I've been hearing from people that uh, during all this who witnessed it was that it was very challenging and stressful at times, but that you were extremely calm 
and that you really, um, I was actually even speaking to someone today, I think there was this, a lady there from Morocco who was very unwell and this friend of hers was saying how you went and visited her every day and, and how it really touched their hearts. But this, um, this sense that you were in the eye of a storm in a way, there was a lot going on around you. And I'm really curious about, you know, how did you, how, how, what do you think helped you through this time and helped you to remain calm and be, you know, kind of a real rock for other people? What was going on inside you at the time? Well, I would say it was just being calm and thinking how we could do our best. Finding the resources and, you know, the most important thing was the team. There, there were people who stood by me. The people, the, whether it was physicians or anesthetists, we used our ophthalmology residents to work in the COVID ward. Everyone had to be educated, everyone had to be trained. Ophthalmic nurses and ophthalmic residents, we have a postgraduate program in eye care, so we use them. And then volunteers were there, food was coming from Brahma Kumari, so it, it, a lot of people were helping. So it's collective effort which mattered the most. So I had, you know, I had the assurance that I can ask whenever I need help. You know, for oxygen supply, we had a lot to depend upon the Brahma Kumaris, you know, the, the transport system. We had um, almost had to put four vehicles into gear, you know, going and coming and bringing oxygen. At least, you know, sometimes the panic button would be switched on. The oxygen is not there. But the moment we would think of it, the truck would arrive, the transport would arrive. Okay. So it was, it was trying times, but I would say, we managed with patience, <laughs> with being in control, you know. We thought we can manage. And, and you, uh, I mean, you're saying it's a teamwork, but, you know, a team also does take a certain kind of leadership and, and these qualities of compassion, uh, people notice that in you, that you do make an effort to connect. What, what do you think your practice is that enables that compassion to emerge? Well, it's, it's basically when you have faith in your own self, when you have faith in yourself and in your team, everything happens in an auto mode. And I would, I would appreciate the physicians, you know, we had only one physician, the other physician was an elderly person. He was a bit scared to go to the COVID ward, but this young physician was always available to us around the clock. Mm. People were working almost 12 hours to 14 hours in a day. So that, that was the real strength, uh, I would say. Yes, we had to meet every day, we had to find ways and means where to get resources, whether the supply. You know, we were able to give the supplies to police, we were able to give the supplies to local hospitals, because we were able to procure. And that too, mainly because of the people whom we had been in touch, people who knew us, whether it was pharmaceutical companies or whether it, it was the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So we had connections and we could manage. But these are, these are kind of relationships that you've built up and, and this is something else I've heard about you, that you are, uh, in a way, you are reaping the reward of the, of the, the connections that you would made over years. So is that something that you feel you you put energy into building up these kind of well, relationships? Well, one thing which I have learned over the years, you know, basically when people are in need of help, you help them. Mm -hmm. And it will come back to you. Yeah. So that, that has been principle. You, you help them, you care about them, and then uh, everything helps. I, I think you know uh, one of our friends, she was admitted with us for diarrhea and then she became our supporter for over the years. So it's, it's like, uh, I would say, it was the conviction that we don't have to turn down a patient. Gradually we were able to procure supplies and we were able to get extra staffs and then we were able to accept. By end of May, we were very comfortable, but then the COVID cases also coming down in June. Hmm. 
And, and the local community itself, how, how did they respond? Because sometimes they've been a bit kind of suspicious. No, as I shared, they initially they were reluctant. They, they wanted me because their livelihood depends on tourists. Yeah. They said, you don't admit any COVID cases. Don't get cases from outside. But we said, okay, I didn't contradict them. But when the patients started flowing, they knew that we are admitting. Mm. And then they came forward. As I said, I did place order. We did make the payment when this gentleman comes with a check for the whole cost, the hoteliers. Oh. And they, they even provided us oxygen concentrators, oxygen cylinders, whatever we wanted, they were ready to give it to us. So the local tourism industry was supporting you right. and appreciating what they, they understood did. because most of the Mount Abu residents were with us and they were treated by us they knew mm. that some some of their kith and kin we have treated in the hours of crisis <laughs> yes. so it's had quite an effect on the whole community there in Mount Abu well it did, people came together I would say mm. there was cohesiveness, people felt that this is the time when they have to put in their best not only the healthcare professionals I have heard about Delhi. There was one gentleman who took the responsibility home to, to, for the cremation of the dead bodies. No one, no relatives were coming close by, but this gentleman took upon him is the responsibility. Gosh. We also had, although we didn't have much deaths, but we had people who were always willing to support the relatives. Mm. And, and as a team, you talked about the importance of a team. Were, were there any practices that you participated in, as uh, all the staff, that you felt helped support support the hospital through, through this event? Was this? See, our training has been good, and we use uh, meditation quite often. You know, during the COVID times, every day morning at four o'clock, we would all meet together. We would have because we were not allowed to go. So we would meet together, have our meditation, have our discourse. That was a regular practice, evening meditation, we would get together. Although what we did was we divided the whole staff into four groups so that we, are, we were at different places, not the whole group at one place. So we were doing, our practices were going on, they didn't stop. So you found that that group meditation practice was something that supported well, that, everyone. That, I would say that was our real strength. As I Your say. main strength. Uh, to ment you know, in hours of crisis, to work together, there were some people who were scared. Mm -hmm. They were scared to death. They would not like to come. But then we were able to manage. And if there were a couple of exceptions, we accepted that also. Yes, I think, it, especially in, in those early days, and mm -hmm. as Swati, indicated, you know, medical staff were dying as well, so I think there was a lot of fear around. Do you feel, do you have any, um, how do you keep up the resilience and stamina of your workforce? How do you feel you support your staff, not just in COVID, but generally at Global Hospital? What's the See, we did our best in providing them love and care, whatever they needed, whatever support in terms of whether it was food or whether it was housing, separate housing for them. And then also we had to really provide them all the protective gears. So all that had to go, you had to be generous in spending. And some some of the staff practice the Raj Yoga meditation, but not everyone. Not everyone. How were you supporting those who wouldn't sort of feel they were part of Brahma Kumaris? Well, they understand, and you know, normally when someone joins us, we do really orient him with what Brahma Kumaris stand for, what meditation is. They do all understand that we, and most of the people who come to us, I would say they understand that they, they, they are leaving a bigger, lucrative job in coming to us. Mm -hmm. Because Mount Abu is a remote place. So mostly people who have stayed on us, who have really been with us for over the years, they understand the mission very well. And do they have their own practices? And yes, they, they, they have their own practices, their own belief systems. And, and um, you were encouraging them, I guess, to 
to whatever they need well, to do. We see the question is their meditation is available to them. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, at least three meditation rooms across the hospital. Okay. And they do understand, but it is their choice. And uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, COVID's placed healthcare services around the world under enormous strain. Um, and it's still continuing. I know here in the UK there is still a lot of staff shortages because people are off sick with COVID. Recruitment is a huge challenge. People are not choosing to enter the healthcare world um, for, work, for a variety of reasons. And there's this huge backlog now. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same for you, but all the things that didn't get attended to because of COVID are now waiting. Um, to be seen. So there's a lot of um, talk about burnout now and um, staff well-being and, and how can staff really keep their enthusiasm for the job, you know, how to survive and thrive in healthcare. And uh, I'd be interested to know what what you do for yourself just to because we saw in that video you're, you're managing or you know, involved in 14 at least different sites. You know, it must be very busy and constant work. So how, how do you look after yourself? Well, uh, as you rightly said, uh, people did feel stressed, particularly people from the other specialties. The surgery knows the surgeon was not interested to operate elective cases. Mm. But the patients did pour in after the COVID and we had to devise systems and processes, encourage them, sit with them, counsel them and gradually started picking. The most, um, I would say, scared were the, our ENT surgeon. Our, you know, basically they have to do endoscopies and they have to operate patients. So it did take some time but we had to discuss it out in the interest of patients. And in the process, initially we didn't have the COVID testing facility in our uh, hospital, but then we acquired that. Now we were screening every patient for COVID, assuring the surgeons and physicians that they are safe patients to handle. And if there was any positive patient, we would treat him, and after he recovers, then only we'll take him for surgery. So, but I would say, in a way, people were understanding. Everyone understood their responsibility, but they wanted their safety at the same place. Mm -hmm. So we had to reassure them, we had to sit with them, counsel them, and uh, in a way we, had, we did suspend our non-emergency services, but now everything is picked up. We do screen, we don't make it mandatory, but if someone has symptoms, then we screen him for COVID. Mm -hmm. And this issue of managing burnout or surviving, and, and I get the feeling you don't like ask, me asking you personal questions. Well, I would say... You're a bit shy, are you? You're a bit humble. No, no. It's, well, we, I, as I shared, um, we train our nurses well. This Vihasa, the values in mm -hmm. healthcare, the spiritual approach we have been using on a regular basis. And now it has become such a popular program that most of the hospitals ask for it oh. across India. So we have to train a group of facilitators who keep traveling. This program is very good, the one which was designed by Janki Foundation. This is going, uh, going across the country. Mm. So this is values in healthcare. Well, because mm. we, you know, this is something, an experiential program, wherein people are able to touch their core qualities. And so is that... The question I asked was, what do you do to look after yourself? <laughs> well, and uh, so is that something you do? Are well, you, I don't are you do anything are special. You, are you touching your core qualities? I, I don't do anything <laughs> special. Yes, I do have my regular meditation hour. My daily routine is I get up at 3.30 in the morning and have my meditation till 4.30. Then I study my spiritual discourse and then I go for a walk, regular exercise, and then get on to the work. <laughs> because I, I, have, I have observed that you need to have 
boundaries. Four to eight in the morning is my personal time. Uh -huh. So I use that for my own care. And then after nine o'clock, it is uh, for the service. But I've noticed you're, you're quite strict about going for your walk. That's yes, that. I do feel mm. physical activity is very important. Mm. Even when I was suffering from COVID, I didn't uh, stop my physical activity. <laughs> Although my physician said, you don't do that. <laughs> so you still went for your walk? <laughs> uh, I could walk in my room. <laughs> no, you walked in your room. Very good. Yes. But what do you... I mean, when you've... You know, I've seen you in your office. You know, when you've got a line of people and someone wants this and someone wants that, and you're, I've seen you sitting there very calmly. What's going on inside your own mind and your own no, when thoughts? When people come seeking help or guidance, mm -hmm. I have to be available to them. My availability is very important to them. That I should be available to. I never close my door. You know, my office is always open. Whether I was in the public sector when I was working in Chandigarh in the administration, then also my door would always be open. And now also, because everyone, I, I sometimes feel that when people need us the most, we should be available. And that, that's, that's something that people say about you, mm. that they do feel that personal connection and that you care about them and, and that means like, a lot to them. I'll, I'll share with you, I never got irritated or disturbed. In the middle of the night I would receive a call from a patient that I need an ambulance but I never thought this is not my responsibility. <laughs> I would get in touch with the right person and give him the assignment that this is the call hmm. because people knew me being in the small town Mm. in a place where all the social organizations come together. So they would call me in the middle of the night that they need an ambulance, they need a bed, they need an oxygen cylinder. So I would, those two, three months, we were all on our feet. Well, I must say, I think if I was called in the middle of the night and someone told me to get an ambulance, I <laughs> well, might get a bit this irritated. This happens in India, it cannot happen. <laughs> yeah. But still, not to get irritated, that's something, you know. So how do you not get irritated? Because it's well, not see, easy. The question is, uh, if people need us and they know you and they, they feel they can trust you, they would only call when they feel that the help would be forthcoming. Mm. So I, I personally feel those were difficult times, those were challenging times, people were suffering, people were dying and we had to help them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a generosity. Was, you, you know, think. I would say injections, medication, remdesivir was not available. People would come to me. So we would supply, we would say, okay, you get, take for your patients. They would come from as far as 300 kilometers from Kota, from Indore, from uh, Ajmer, they would come to us. They needed medication and we provided them. Mm -hmm. We didn't think at that time that we, need would, we would need, but we were able to procure more supplies. Mm -hmm. So I would say it, it is being kind and generous is a human nature, I feel. is a human quality. It's nothing mm -hmm. divine about it, being <laughs> kind. <laughs> Is there anything, you mentioned the word divine, is there anything that you feel you take from the divine that helps you to maintain your kindness and your, and your caring? Well, connection with the divine or connection with what we call Shibaba, Godfather, you know, it gives you strength. It recharges you. It keeps you always, uh, I would say, prepared for any situation. Because connection is very important, like we charge our mobile phones mm -hmm. all the time so that, so we need to charge ourselves also. Mm -hmm. I feel empowering yourself and feeling good about yourself is only possible if you are connected with the Supreme. What, what does that feel like to you when you're in the middle of your working day? I mean, you use the words connected to the Supreme, which sounds a bit, you know, strange. but. What does it actually feel like to you? How do you feel you're getting strength from that connection? No, we, honestly speaking, I think we need to revisit our values. And I, I personally feel it is not meditation, but meditative way of life. The yogi way of life, because the yogi life is more important to us. You know, if we are meditating, and if we don't use meditation at workplace, 
I, what I mean is not that I would sit and chant mantras or... <laughs> but the only question is that stability comes to your mind. And uh, we have a practice in the hospital that we play music. Every hourly we play a music which is for maybe uh, one and a half minute to three minutes. So that music, everyone understand that music is for meditation. They would stop even uh, while working in the ward for those particular moments and recharge themselves. We use that meditation around the day, mm -hmm. every hourly. I mean, I like that, that you say it's, it's, it's a meditative lifestyle that really holds you in good stead right. in a way. It, it, it's something you've practiced over a, mm -hmm. a period of time and you practice at regular intervals during the day. Um, so, it, it, so then when you need it, it, it you, you feel you can draw on that, that strength. I mean, one thing about the whole COVID thing which was really very difficult for people was um, this, the, the number of deaths. And I mean, I don't know if 65 deaths was a lot for you, maybe more than you're normally used to, but just, uh, you know, for relatives not being able to be with the people who were passing, but also for staff losing colleagues and then so many patients one after the other. What, what's your feeling about how spirituality can help us process this kind of... Uh, kind of trauma or this, this sudden death or death in great numbers? See, grief counselling is important. At the time when we lose a patient, the relatives need to be counselled. They need to be talked to. So a physician was good in it. He was talking. The nurses, they were talking to patients. I know young, in the second wave, young patients died. You know, that was the irony. In mm. the first wave, the elderly patients went but in the second wave, the young patients were mostly affected. And sometimes, uh, it, I, I, even in Mount Abu, I can recollect certain cases where both the parents passed away. So it's, it's not that um, things were not happening, but things were happening. And in a way, we were able to handle them. We had the help. And spirituality did help us because not only doctors but our nurses were also able to handle those grief counseling part. And uh, we were even sometimes, you know, the patients would expect us to be at their funeral also, you know, the relatives, mm -hmm. because they were so sore, so pain, so much in pain. So it did make difference because the Mount Abu population is only about 30,000. But most of our patients were coming from Sirohi and Jalor and all these places also. But majority of the patients came from Mount Abu, the hotel, the tourists and... Mm. And, and what do you feel is the, the, the spirituality or the spiritual grief counselling that can help people through this kind of time or even your staff what kind of things would you I think the most important saying? thing in the Indian philosophy in the Indian ethos is acceptance acceptance that this is a journey and this body is a physical costume and we are soul is on its onward journey mm -hmm. so we were able to counsel patients because people accept that so and I would say like Death was everywhere. People did know that they can come to death. If they don't come, they, if they didn't come in time to us or whether we were not able to come up to their expectations. But we did, I, I would say that we did our death audit also. We used to regularly do the audit and look into where we can improve, where we, we could have done better. And is there anything you feel you've learnt as an organisation or anything that might, you might do differently in the hospital now or any plans for the future? Well, I would say we have to take the first step forward. Mm -hmm. People would join you. you. Whatever you do, you need to have courage. And when you have courage to put the first foot forward, people do come and join you. The help is always forthcoming and uh, that's why I, I personally feel 
in times of crisis someone has to lead mm -hmm. and what would be the qualities of that leadership quality is <laughs> I would say courage and compassion and generosity. You need to be generous and kind. W was there anything you learnt about yourself through this whole episode? Some something that, some insight or something well, that you realised? I consider this? my role as a facilitator, as supportive channel. I used to support them, facilitate them, inspire them be with them in the ward although mm, they would stop me from coming but I even then I would don the PP kit and go to the ward and mm -hmm. talk to the staff so it did uh, you know basically it's people should feel that you stand by them yeah yeah and I think it sounds like you you took the risk which I think is where courage comes in isn't it you know it's, it's something with your heart that you take that risk to to really live your values and and be with people and and be compassionate in that situation mm. um, I, I sense you're you, you don't like <laughs> blowing your own trumpet as we we say in English it's not easy for you to mm. to say what you did but I have heard from people that observed your behavior at that time that that, they were, that you were really um, no, As I said in the rock. beginning, you have to be available to people. Yeah. Once you are available, they can approach you, they can ask for help. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important quality. You know, in hours of crisis, we always have to offer our best. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you think that organizations could do to look after their staff better? You know, well, I feel the doctors and health care professionals under, are under large amount of stress. They need to pause, they need to slow down and look within and find some way of, you know, uh, I would say increasing their coping capacity. Increasing their coping capacity or their resilience, I suppose. Resilience, you know. That's quite they, a... Mm favorite word these days <laughs> mm, resilient. Um, and what would your advice be on how to increase your coping capacity well, if you're a I healthcare think, professional I, I, as from my personal experience I feel that training of the doctors need to incorporate these things these values these uh, I would say the doctors need to be prepared the medical students like now in India the national medical Commission has now included ethics as part of their training. So we are able to make inroads and go to the medical schools and teach them values. Mm. So it's, it's change has to happen at the training level. Yes, yes, no, I, I totally agree with that. Mm. And I think um, these, these uh, self-care skills should be part of the curriculum. Spirituality has mm. to be used as a very good tool for mm. the medical students to practice in their life and for patients. You know, I feel if we are spiritual, I'm not saying that we should follow rituals, or, but spiritual means if we have kind of that uh, ethos within us and when we are interacting with the patient it is an interaction between two human beings. Yes. If the, we understand that and then the spirituality also teaches us to look within and feel that what is my where does my fulfillment come from? Where do I find purpose in life? Purpose in life is serving people. So if that spirituality is incorporated into medical uh, syllabus, that would make all the difference. Mm. And as you say, in the Values and Healthcare program, the spiritual skills in that program are meditation, visualization, creativity, fun, self-reflection. So all these are tools and skills that you can actually teach uh, students, which will help them build that resilience. So we have been using regularly for yeah. these things. We even in the nursing education, uh, in our nursing college, we make it part of the, it is mandatory for the children to go through all this. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that we're now um, moving to the part of the program where we can open it up to you um, in our audience to ask a question. 
and we have some roving mics. So um, be very nice to have a little bit of interaction with you. I hope this conversation has maybe stimulated some thinking in you. So um, if anyone would like to ask something, this gentleman here. Would... Just to say this session's being recorded, so um, it's us who's being recorded, but if you don't, if you want to remain anonymous, then don't uh, say your name or anything, but you can if you want to, it's up to you. It's on, I think. Is there a problem? I don't need it if you can hear me. I think it is on. It's on. Yeah. My name is Amarjit Singh Bor, mm -hmm. but uh, the English call me Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm trained loss and briefman counselor. During the pandemic, I was one of the 15 uh, psychologists around the world who was providing mental health support to the frontline workers. We heard the true stories from every angle, from the patients, their relatives, the professionals, the counselors. It was unusual circumstances. My hats off to Mr. Mehta, who provided such an inspiration to everybody working in that field, the way he handled the situation in his uh, institution. Um, I have a question for you, Mr. Mehta. Any counselor, loss and bereavement counselor, it's a very difficult time when you don't have the answer to listen to the people and you don't know how to encourage them to cope with the situation. What your institution did in those circumstances? I, I agree with you. At times we feel, you know, only thing at that time we can just be with the patient, be with their relatives. Sometimes they were outbursts also. People were um, upset also. But we had to accept that this is natural for them. And I would say we, we do feel that at that particular moment we may not be able to do anything. But later on, after the little time has elapsed, when the patient is quiet and the person, the relatives are quiet, then you can talk to them. Immediately if you start counseling them, they may not accept it. Because they would ask reasons why the patient has died, what has happened, they would like to know what did not go right with the patient. We don't try to force our counseling on them, but we let the time take its toll. And afterwards when we talk to the patients, they, they, their relatives, they accept. Initially, you know, initial response could be of denial. Well, we all know when we lo lose somebody, we go through five stages. Denial, anger, depression, and bargaining, and finally the acceptance comes. When the acceptance is a big word. If I open it to the audience, everybody gave a different explanation for the acceptance. It's easy to say the acceptance is um, comes naturally or you know uh, with the time. The acceptance to one person is different to the other person. Exactly. So, what do you think, in medical term, the acceptance should be? Well, I personally feel not in COVID, but even otherwise also, we need to be honest with the patient. We have to tell him the full story, what went wrong or what went right. I have seen in cases of sudden death, what a kind of upheavals take place in a hospital. In India, the doctors have been exposed to violence. 
But I feel we have to be honest with the patient. We need to keep updating the patient at regular intervals. What is going on? If it is a sudden news is broken, then the patient gets into shock or denial. So I, I do understand. But people who are spiritual, people who are religious, they are able to cope it well. I have seen that when, when we, you talk to a person who is more religious, he would be able to accept the things in a peaceful way. But other people, it sometimes becomes difficult to control them. They might even get aggressive. So, but at that particular time, we need to be peaceful. We need to show patience. This is what we do. I have faced situations and where I would say, uh, the challenges can be many, the sudden death in, in the operating room, anything can happen and you have to accept that and talk to the patient, be honest with them and uh, they do really come back to a peaceful mode of talking. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Tony, and I, I'm sure you've got a lot of life experiences that you can share with us and may, maybe we'll talk afterwards. Anyone else? There's a lady um, back there. Dr. Patabhai, Namaste. Marina, we've just arrived. Asha and myself. You know that we, Mama and I, have really tremendously benefited from your generous, compassionate care at the hospital and all the people. And the reason I've smiled for the last few years is as a consequence of that. It gave me my life back. Yet I want to say, I still haven't learned how to deal with the panic that I feel when um, circumstances don't go the way I wanted to, despite hard intentions and efforts. And that panic manifests in bursts of anger, frustration, crying, overwhelm, all of those things. And I would just really appreciate knowing how to handle that despite having a spiritual connection and a practice. That's the first part, and I have something else I'd like after to know. <laughs> well, in any given situation, when a thing comes to me, I always think, what are my options? Whether I can be, I create panic and I create stress for others and lose their support also. And the other is I stay quiet and peaceful and ask for help. You know, normally in a situation sometimes we try to suppress our emotions. We only express our anger. But if we are peaceful and ask for help, I would say in any given situation, we all are human beings. We all need help and support. So whenever we are in a crisis, we should seek the professional help. We should seek the spiritual help. And it is sometimes it happens with everyone. Everyone gets upset. But if we seek help, if we seek guidance, if we seek support, it will be forthcoming. It's not that I don't get disturbed. I do get disturbed. But I feel what is the right place for me to go and seek help. So we have to go to the right place to seek help, to seek support and seek care. And we always have to make a right choice in these situations. Yes, thank you. And that's why I'm back here today in front of you and we'll meet you afterwards. My second question is, um, Having experienced the culture and the values and the ethics at Global Hospital, I think it's real what that you do is so much needed globally, but not just in the medical industry, uh, like in the school industry, you know, education. How, what is being done can be done to use those successes and best practices elsewhere. Well, Brahma Kumaris have been doing this for, in India, as I know, and even in the West, Living Values was our project for schools and children. 
And we all have to make a collective effort if you want to bring in change within the society, within our education system, our healthcare system. Everyone has to come forward. And uh, in India, we have uh, evolved a syllabus for the school children. Then we have even evolved a syllabus for the teachers so that they can pick up values and train, this, uh, train the students. So it's a long journey. It's not an easy thing, but it should happen. It, it would happen, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else like to? There's a gentleman down the front here. Om Shanti. My name is Mahendra C. Jadeja, and, and I always said, call me Mahendra C. Jadeja in English as well. <laughs> uh, I haven't changed yet. Uh, I'm very grateful to the seva the hospital is doing, because my mother has been in uh, Mount Abu since last 25 years, Good, the great service. You have done, Dr. Ji, fantastic things you've mentioned about uh, what has happened to the coronas and everything there. My question is a forthcoming monkey box. What are you preparation for you know, the monkey box? What would you advise? How prepared you are and how prepared the general public? Because sometimes awareness can cure early stage. And what I heard that uh, monkeypox, uh, especially, is very effective to the lady skin and all that. I have no clue, but uh, you've been in uh, this industry, and I just wonder what are your thoughts, what are your advice, and how we can tackle it in a such a way that there's a minimum casualty in forthcoming, you know, the pandemic in case if it does come. To. Thank you. Well, honestly speaking, we are not prepared for monkeypox. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just happening in India. It has just started. But I, what I read in the newspapers, because there are only about four or five cases that have happened in India, and Indian government has already invited um, people interested in producing a vaccination for monkeypox. They are, they are gearing up. And uh, um, I would say we would have to study more. We would have to go into causes. What I read in the World Health Organization's official statement about um, sexual partners and other things, they, have, they are talking about that most of the cases have happened in those people who have multiple sex partners. And they are advising to really take care of that part. We need to study further. We need to go into the depth of monkeypox. Uh, I, I personally haven't taken the time off to study that, but I'm sure we would have to gear up. How trust you are with the figures of uh, government? You know, as you just mentioned about four and five, because maybe people are not telling the you know the coming forward because sometimes. In the United Kingdom, what I heard, it's, it's in the hundreds of, maybe in a thousand cases already here, in a small, which is you know, the like, size of the, you know, the Gujarat state. Now, being in India, and you just mentioned, Gary said, I just wonder whether the government is taking any special issue or not, nothing else. Uh, no, I agree with you. See, we have to be skeptical, we have to be prepared. And uh, as far as I know, we have to rely on something. The WHO has given the figures up till now are only 18,000 cases across the world. And that too, as I shared with you, the statement comes that mostly it has happened with people who are gay or who have sexual partners and they are advising to really take care of that part. But I'm sure we need to gear up, we need to research more into it and see what, what is in store for us. Well, I think, uh, you know, as a general principle, there could be people are saying there can be any number of pandemics that, you know, you could, we could have this test again for, for any kind of infectious illness. So I think it is being prepared for what 
ever might happen suddenly, isn't it? It could come from anywhere. No, uh, I, I definitely agree that, um, but at least I would accept I haven't studied <laughs> anything about it. I think we're going to have to, to move on, but I just had one question to finish off to ask you because it, 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 it was something about, we talk about giving hope to people and it got me thinking, how do you give hope to somebody? What's your, your sense? Because we often deal with people who seem to be in a hopeless situation. How do you feel you give hope to people? To See, I had asked this question to Dr. Ashok Mehta. He's a cancer surgeon. I asked yeah. him, you operate so many critical cases and you know the patient has very little time to survive. How do you really counsel them? Yeah. So it's, it's a question of we have to do our best. We tell the patient, we tell the relatives that we would do our best. That's how hope giving hope in terms of uh, I would say having patience, having peace having positivity that would work it has been now very well known that uh, you know positive emotions such as hope, such as laughter, they do increase our immunity, hmm. it is well researched now and if we follow those principles I feel we would be able to cope up with serious illnesses also well there was a study done on breast cancer patient survivor and they found that people who had uh, groups together, group therapy and counseling session, they, uh, their five year survival rates are much more. I mean, uh, my husband and I were talking recently, there was an article about the placebo effect. Do you remember yes, that? Uh, I do. Mm. Where, in fact, even if people got a pill that they knew was a placebo, they still did better. So it's the, the power of thought is very... No, I, I definitely agree with you. Power of positive and powerful thought. Not only positive, but powerful, powerful thought. thought. <laughs> that can make tremendous difference. There are spontaneous remissions. Mm. And not everyone uh, who gets infected with any illness would succumb to it. People mm. come out of it also. I mean, I also feel that, for me, you know, it, even when it looks like a hopeless case, the ultimate hope or the ultimate positive thought is when you say to people, even if your body dies, you're not going to die. Mm, you know, that, you, that's, a, that's a valid fact. <laughs> yeah. So that's a very helpful thing I've found to share with Thank you. people who are in terminal illness. And on that note then, I think it's time for us to have some positive powerful thoughts together. So I'm going to invite um, Rachel, Rachel Priestman, who's a, a student here um, of the Brahma Kumaris and has got a background in urban regeneration and the arts. And uh, Rachel has been helping a, a team that goes into hospitals in this area and teaches meditation to or leads meditations for the staff which uh, I think in their busy schedules, they really appreciate that. So I'm going to um, ask us all to have five minutes meditation together and Rachel's going to guide our thoughts with her commentary. So sit comfortably and enjoy a meditation. So I'll just speak out, I'll just speak out a few words and just allow yourself to take them where you would like to take them and to experience the feelings that, that they wake up in you. So it's always good when I start to meditate to really focus on relaxing my body, making it comfortable, making it still, so that it doesn't take any of my attention, just for a moment. It's quite still. And then I'd like you to imagine that there's a space, a beautiful space in your mind that you are creating just for you. So amidst all the busy thoughts, the facts, the memories, the to-dos, there is this space 
me space. And I can come to this space whenever I choose, whenever I need to. And I tap into that inner goodness, that inner strength that is always mine. But sometimes I lose sight of it. I forget about it. When things happen, and there may be fear, and there may be uncertainty, this is the place I need to bring myself to. This space inside my own mind, where I can feel the peace within myself. And not only peace, but also the love, that natural compassion, natural generosity, and kindness, that enables me to be my best and to give my best in whatever's happening. And in this space where I experience that inner goodness, that inner power, I come to know myself in quite a different way. Where all the labels and the roles and the stories have disappeared. And it's just I, the soul, the being of light, the being of peace, the being of inner strength. And in this awareness, in this experience of myself, I then can connect, I can resonate with a higher source of peace and a higher source of power. I feel a true relationship, a true connection, a link with the divine that re-energizes my own strength my own qualities. And I can bring myself to this beautiful space whenever I choose, whenever I need, and give myself quality time with myself by myself and for myself so that then I can be my best I can do my best and whatever's happening I can give my best Om Shanti Can you feel how a flow of beautiful 
positive spiritual thoughts like that changes the atmosphere. Can you feel it? It's beautiful, isn't it? So it's quite useful to do that. I remember years ago when my boss used to come to see me and he had to sit in a chair in my recovery room if I was busy with my patients. And that was the chair that I used to meditate in. <laughs> And it was, a, it was a battered old chair. But when he sat in it, he said, this chair's really comfortable. And I thought, hmm, I think it's the vibration. <laughs> so sometimes, I, it, it, just kind of responding to this thing of hope, because actually sometimes we, we're not quite sure what we can do, but just to be able to create a beautiful energy with our thoughts and feelings actually can help, can't it? Yeah? Yes, I think so. Right, so thank you very much for that, Rachel. That was lovely. So, um, we'd like to get down. Okay. Yes, I'm going to thank you. Very stimulating. Yes, okay. <laughs> it wasn't in my notes. Yes, yeah, sure, so. Sarah and Pratap would like to come down, yeah. Thank you, Pratap, for our conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Very happy to be here. <laughs> mm. so we, we can go down there. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've heard a lot of conversations a lot around these themes over the years, but I found that conversation very, very stimulating and very insightful. So thank you. So I'm now going to invite uh, Arnold Dessa onto the stage, and he's, Arnold is a, a medical and scientific advisor for the Janke Foundation, and he's going to read us a poem which he will explain. And then I'll ask uh, Suja, Suja Chandan, who's a hospital social worker, to come and give a vote of thanks at the end. Thank you, David. Good evening, everybody. I wonder whether you're as curious as I am about the score in the game. Does anybody know? <laughs> Nobody knows the score of the game, even though it's just a few blocks away from us. <laughs> OK. Hmm? Nil nil. Okay. I've selected two pieces of uh, of writing, so you're going to get two for the price of one. The first is from an essay called "A Guide to Finding Courage in Difficult Times," and is written by David White, who's an Anglo-Irish poet. Although this is a piece of prose. Courage is a word that tempts us to think outwardly, to run bravely against opposing fire, to do something under besieging circumstances, and perhaps above all, to be seen to be doing it in public, to show courage, to be celebrated in story and rewarded with medals and given accolades. But a look at its linguistic origin is to deepen our understanding, for it comes from the medieval French word cour, which means, of course, heart. To be courageous is not necessarily to go anywhere or do anything, except to make conscious those things we already feel deeply, and then to live through the unending vulnerabilities of those consequences. To be courageous is to seat our feelings deeply in the body and in the world. To be courageous is to stay close to the way we were made, 
Courage is what love looks like when tested by simple, everyday necessities of being alive. The only choice we have as we mature is how we inhabit our vulnerability, how we become larger and more courageous and more compassionate through our intimacy with loss. Our choice is to inhabit vulnerability as generous citizens of loss, robustly and fully, or conversely, as misers and complainers, reluctant and fearful, always at the gate of existence, but never bravely and completely attempting to enter, never wanting to risk ourselves, never walking fully through the door. And my second choice is from the great Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, Tagore died in 1941. Uh, he received, he was the first, they call it non-European, he was the first uh, Indian to receive a Nobel Prize in any field. Uh, an interesting fact emerged as I was researching this. And in 1912, Tagore lived not three and a half miles from here in Hampstead. I mean, he lived in London for a year. He's also not just a great Bengali poet. He's considered to be one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. Let me not pray to be sheltered from dangers, but to be fearless in facing them. Let me not beg for the stilling of my pain, but for the heart to conquer it. Let me not look for allies in life's battlefields, but to my own strength. Let me not crave an anxious fear to be saved, but hope for the patience to win my freedom. Grant me that I may not be a coward, feeling your mercy in my success alone. But let me find the grasp of your hand in my failure. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Iga. Thank you, Dr. Pratap Mida. It was such a soulful conversation, um, not just with courage and compassion, but there was generosity, there was honesty, there was simplicity, there was kindness, there was care. And I think we all experienced that, didn't we? It was like an embodiment of all these lovely qualities. Thank you very much for that, for sharing. And yes, a round of applause for that beautiful conversation. Thank you. Um, and I have a really nice list of names, and this is a really nice job to do, because all I have to say is thank you to a whole lot of people who's made this event um, happen. Thank you to the Brahma Kumaris for hosting, for this beautiful house, for enabling us to be here and experience the calm and the peace. Um, thank you, David, for holding the program together. Um, thank you, Karishma, for your soulful singing. That was really, I think it'll keep us going. Um, thank you, Swati, for sharing your experience of the hospital and resonating what everybody in UK was experiencing during that time and giving us um, a view into your experience. Thank you, Rachel, for your beautiful, soulful meditation. It did transport us to a different place. Thank you, Arnold, for a very beautiful reading of the poem and giving us a context, and also asking us a question about what's happening next door. You did make our attention go a bit different. Um, also, all the people who've been tirelessly in the background, thank you, Urvashi. 
Thank you, Deepti, Viraj, Toots, Sister Gemini. Uh, thank you for all of you who has been quietly, and they're not right now, but I know they're all around, spread out in different parts of the room. Thank you to all the ushers, to the refreshment team, and the technical support who is at the back incognito and delivering this program, not only for us to enable us to have a really good experience here, but also who are online. I know there are quite a few viewers who are online um, and who have been able to be part of this program. So there's online streaming, the photos that have been taken, and the video that would come up um, in both the Janki Foundation website and I think Global Corporation website as well. Um, thank you for Kala, who would be posting something on the website regarding the program, and it will come in due course. Um, so most of all, thank you for the audience to being here and you know to be completely present and to listen. Um, intently and deeply. So if um, whoever is online and who is here, if you wish to know anything more about the Janki Foundation, I know David gave a good view in terms of the hospital and about the link between the charity and the hospital. So if you need to know more about the Janki Foundation or ways in which you could support its activities, which also include assisting the work of the Global Hospital. They can go to the Janki Foundation website. And I think it's, um, it probably is a little bit light for us to read here, but I think I'm told the online uh, viewers will be able to read it well. It's um, www.jankifoundation.org. And also you would find that there are lots of um, courses that the Global Corporation House um, has on their events page. So you would find a lot of online and in-house events like the one we had today and it's really nice to have that face-to-face -face interaction with people in the house. Um, it's available in different languages. It, there is on-demand section, there's a catch-up section, there's a meditation hub. Um, they're all available on the website, and the Global Cooperation House website is by the same name, www.globalcooperationhouse.org. So if you're not on our mailing list, that's the Janki Foundation mailing list or the Brahma Kumari's mailing list, and would like to receive weekly emails, not weekly from JF, but we would have events and courses, you can subscribe it on both the websites. Uh, I also want to say that there's a bookshop downstairs and it's open and there are really lovely resources that you could go um, and have a peek and you might find something useful. You could take it as a gift uh, for yourself or for someone else. Um, the ushers will be able to guide you out um, and, um, and you'd probably have a sweet surprise, I think, towards the end. Um, I just wanted to, I, I mean, it occurred to me that probably we do have a few events that's coming up as part of um, uh, Janki Foundation and I, I just thought probably I should just um, list that. And um, we have a uh, one-day silent retreat at the Quiet View at Kent, um, which happens, um, we've got one on the 6th of August, it's a Saturday, it's called Finding Hope in Silence. I know there was some conversation today we had about hope. Um, and the next one is on the 8th of October, so there's on the 6th of August, um, and on the 8th of October. And there are self-care days, uh, which is online sessions. We have on, it looks like the first Mondays. So 8th of August, 5th of September, 3rd of October. On Mondays, that's an online session, 10.30 to 3.30. And we also, this is also a special year, and it's really lovely to have Dr. Mita here in the special year. It's the 25th anniversary of the Janki Foundation, and we are planning an event on the 10th of December um, here. It's a Saturday. It's a, it's a day event, so um, it, this is an advance notice for people to put it on their diaries and do come for it. I think it will be great for us to celebrate it together. Thank you all. <laughs>